This year, the Formula One world champion made the transition to Indy cars look almost easy. With a mastery that has brought him the adoration of fans worldwide, he carried his IndyCar rookie stripes from the pole all the way to the checkered flag despite mistakes in Australia. The first man to accomplish this feat in nine decades of IndyCar racing. Nigel Mansell is, in every action, a champion. But his toughest test would come on the unforgiving ovals that are the heritage of IndyCar. Bull rings like Phoenix have a way of humbling the greatest drivers, as it did four-time Phoenix champion Johnny Rutherford. Just a few feet away, the concrete walls wait. Yesterday, even Nigel's skill wasn't enough. Practice lap over the track record, and then suddenly the world champion's car was in shambles. Black skid marks and a hole in the concrete wall told the story. Because of Nigel's previous spine-shattering injuries, the rescue was slow and calculated. The crowd watched, stunned and worried. As his mount was towed away, Nigel was air evacuated to a hospital with a concussion and bruises, but already he wants back behind the wheel. Mansell's departure redirects the spotlight to others, like IndyCar world champion Bobby Rahal. Last year, Phoenix was his first win on the championship trail with his new team. This year, it's a new car, potentially faster, but much more difficult and time-consuming to develop. Now newer names, like Bobby Gordon, surge to the front. Driving for A.J. Boyd, he displays a disconnected flair that earned him a third place in his run at Australia. Rick Mears, the acknowledged Oval King, is now retired. His throne is vacant. The search for his successor begins now. Today, from Phoenix International Raceway, it's the Valvoline 200. The mile in the desert. These bull rings are where IndyCar racing truly began. Hello and welcome, I'm Paul Page. These little racetracks, these short miles, are terrific for the fans, but they intimidate every race driver that ever got near one of them. Nigel Mansell, the defending World Formula One champion, got a little too close yesterday, slammed the wall. Now let's get a full update on that situation from Gary Gerald. Well, we're down here in turn number one. Nigel's crew estimates from commuter information, computer information, that he was running at 182 miles per hour as he entered this first turn. As he lost control, he impacted the wall, absorbed 20 Gs. That was how hard he hit. It's truly amazing that in view of that impact that he was able to survive with just a mild concussion. He does have some severe bruising on the right shoulder and in his lower back. But he was released from Good Samaritan Hospital here in Phoenix this morning and in fact left Phoenix around 9 o'clock on a private jet and should be arriving now near his home in South Florida at this very time. Yesterday afternoon, we had a chance to spend some time with Nigel in the hospital. His co-owner, Paul Newman, was alongside chatting. Mansa was feisty. He wants to race. He remembers a similar scenario in Brazil last year. I mean, I was knocked out in Brazil uh, when my great friend Ayrton Senna decided to have me off. And, you know, I hit the wall there and um, had a bit of concussion and obviously uh, had a few other problems. But... I didn't get any sleep that night and had to go through some sort of medical test the next day, which I managed to sort of uh, smile my way through. And then, you know, lo and behold, I wasn't on top form, but I managed to win the race. So, I mean, um, I'm not knocking the rules and regulations and the medical profession because they're first class, but I always thought rules were there to be broken. And, uh, I mean, heck, I'd like to be the first one to break them. And if I can drive tomorrow, I mean, I'd love to. Even if I start last, I don't mind. But the rules prevent Nigel from starting. Now, in the starting field itself, the first 11 positions are covered by a single second. With his first career poll and a new track record, it's Scott Goodyear in the McKenzie Special. Alongside is Mario Andretti in the Kmart Texaco Haviland car, a three-time winner here on the Phoenix Mile. In row number two to the inside is Emerson Fittipaldi in the Marlboro Penske. He was the runner-up in the Australian season opener. Alongside is Roberto Guerrero in the Budweiser King. His first career win came here in 1987. Row number three is Paul Tracy in a Marlboro Penske. He finished fourth here last year. And Raul Boisel in his first start here in the Duracell Mobile One Charger since 1990. 
Inside row four, it's Bobby Rahal in the Miller Genuine Draft, the defending champion of the Valvoline 200. And Teo Fabi in the Pennzoil Special. He scored his first victory here in his rookie year in 1983. In the fifth row to the inside is Jimmy Vassar in the Codalux STP car, the best start ever for this California sophomore. And Ari Leyendijk in the Target Scotch video machine. He won this race two years ago. In row number six, Mark Smith in the Craftsman PC-92 Chevy. And Scott Brayton in the Amway Northwest Airlines machine. The seventh row, Al Hunter Jr. in the Valvoline Lola. And Danny Sullivan alongside in the Molson Lola. In row number eight, it's Scott Pruitt in the Tobacco Free America car. And Eddie Cheever in the Quorum Security Systems machine. In the ninth row, Hiro Matsushita in the Panasonic Special. And Buddy Lazier in the Viper Auto Security Apples B Lola. In the 10th row, it's Stefan Johansson in the AMAX Energy and Metals car. Alongside is Robbie Gordon in A.J. Foyt's Copenhagen Racing. In the 11th row, it's Lynn St. James in the J.C. Penney Nike Lola. And Dave Kudrave alongside in the Agip Andrea Mobile Lola Chevy. In the 12th row, it's Robbie Buell in the MyJack car. And Marco Greco in the International Sports Limited machine. And alone in the last row, it's Ross Bentley in the Agfa Rain-X Lola Chevrolet. One third of the starting field have never taken the green flag in an Indy car at Phoenix. The Valvoline 200 is brought to you by Valvoline. People who know use Valvoline. By Goodyear, number one in tires. By Subway, the place where fresh is the taste. And by Kawasaki. Kawasaki, let the good times roll. here eagerly awaits the start of the engine at Phoenix International Raceway. For months, the focus of the racing world has been on two very special men. Here's Sam Posey. When Michael Andretti went to Formula One and Nigel Mansell came here to IndyCar Racing, it was inevitable that their fate would seem to be intertwined. There's a kind of ironic symmetry to the fact that both men had very bad crashes in just their second races. This was Michael's crash in Brazil last week. A promising fifth place on the grid, but a violent crash with Michael hitting first the wall and then being hit by Gerhard Berger. You know, over the winter, a whole new order of things has emerged in IndyCar racing. And Bobby Unser, tell us about it. Well, Sam Scott Goodyear, the young Canadian who won his first career race at Michigan last year and finished second in Indianapolis. Now, he's on the pole here today and he'll be fast. Fourth on the grid is Roberto Guerrero, a face we've seen many times. He won here in 1987, and he's driving for drag racer Kenny Bernstein. And right behind him on the grid is Penske driver Paul Tracy, who has taken over now that Rick Mears is retired. And remember, this promising student has the best teacher you could get with Mears in his pits. Now let's go down to Jack Root in the pits. Well, Bobby, those performances by the Walker Motorsports team and Scott Goodyear brought an influx of additional sponsorship money over the offseason. And they say that's the major reason why they're performing better. And here is the long and the short of it. They were able to order their cars and their engines much earlier than they were used to. They selected Ford power plants because they selected Fords. They were the first groups to receive Lola's. They encountered over 1,300 miles of testing, including 500 right here at PIR. Goodyear and Walker both say that's the difference between last year and this year for this team. The flag here at Phoenix Racetrack is at half-staff today for Alan Kowicki, the victim of that plane crash in rural Tennessee on Thursday night. Alan was a unique individual, a man who had the courage to step out of the conventional mainstream and carve a path of his own. The dream he had fostered began to unfold here at Phoenix in 1988 when he scored his first big league victory. Alan Kowicki, the Winston Cup champion. He will be missed by all of us. Race of the IndyCar season is about to begin as the field pulls away. The command, lady and gentlemen, start your engines. Recognizing the presence of Lynn St. James in her first start here. The race, 138 miles an hour. The record set by Roberto Guerrero in 87. The first fuel stop, we expect at about 64 laps. And it's a beautiful day here in Phoenix. By the way, the first woman ever to drive an Indy car drove here at Phoenix. It was Arlene Hiss. The track, well, it's kind of an oval, but there is a dog leg one mile around, 11 degree banking in turns one and two, and nine degrees in three and four. You can run flat out through turns three and four. 
the IndyCar itself, well, there's the rules. There was what it has to be, that 161 cubic inch displaced turbocharged engine developing upwards of 800 horsepower. A magnificent machine. The chassis in this particular race here today and how they have lined up with Lola still the dominant uh, power. Penske's got a few chassis in there and the RH1 is what used to be the True Sport chassis. Here are the engines. Chevrolet, again dominant in this division. Eight Chevy V8C engines. The C is the newer version, the uprate of last year's engine. You ride now with the defending champion at this race, Bobby Rahal. But let's go pit side to Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, remember in Australia, the big story at the end of the race was fuel. Nigel Mansell, he ran out of fuel, even though he told us that he had plenty of fuel to finish. His closest competitor, the P behind me, of course, that was Emerson Fittipaldi. They thought they didn't have enough fuel when they checked they had two and a half, two and a half gallons. With all the new engines and all the new chassis, it's not that a driver will run out of fuel, but they still don't have it down to a precise science. So in a case of a race like today, when to win, you have to make it in two stops. Fuel could become a factor in determining when you come in and when you don't. How about some more information, Gary Gerald, from your end of pit road? Well, you remember in Australia two weeks ago, Robbie Gordon had a great race, a third-place finish. A.J. Foyt on scene here today, but what a weekend it's been. They blew an engine yesterday. Then this morning, Gordon got into the wall in the warm-up session. They had to really scramble to get the car repaired. It's the 92 chassis. They rolled it out as virtually the command was being made for everybody to be in the car. It was that close. Now he's on the track. We'll see how he responds from deep in the field. Keep in mind, it's only the second time that Robbie Gordon has been on a one-mile old. So we'll keep an eye on Robbie Gordon. We're on with Al Unser Jr. now. You had a brief glimpse off the back of Mario Andretti's car. He had a spectacular qualifying effort yesterday. And here is Robbie Gordon. Back, back in the field. We'll have his work cut out if he's to have any kind of result similar to that third place. And there's the man who has been bringing him along throughout this weekend, his car owner, A.J. Foyt. So now they begin to find alignment behind the PPG pace car, and we're ready for 200 miles of racing at Phoenix International. This mile in the desert produces some great races. We expect nothing less here today. The entire field begins to close in. Sparkling new machinery here at the start of the season. Remember, a lot of drivers in this field have not taken the green flag in an Indy car here at Phoenix. So now the field comes into full alignment. Scott Goodyear, his first pull, brings the field toward the green flag. And into turn one with Mario challenging to the outside. And Mario Andretti picks up the lead on the backstretch. At the same time, Roberto Guerrero moves up to challenge both Fittipaldi and Tracy. of turn four, Roberto Guerrero still running high in a battle for third place as Mario Andretti takes the lead at the conclusion of lap number one. There's that battle with Guerrero and the rest of the field as he splits up the two Penske cars looking for racing room. Fittipaldi just in front, then Guerrero and Paul Tracy just behind. And just behind Paul Tracy, that's Raul Boisel, as they come to the conclusion of the second lap of the run. And Scott Goodyear, who started on the pole, has decided for a more casual approach to the start of this race. And lets Mario Andretti run out in front, if left is, in fact, the appropriate word. Now take a look at Paul Tracy as he begins to challenge Roberto Guerrero and ducks inside in three. Tracy's still on the charge and challenge. The rest of the field behind the front runners have all lined up single file now. Looking carefully over this track, it's very hot here. The track surface temperature above 100 degrees. But Paul Tracy is allowing no room to Roberto Guerrero. He is looking for a place to pass. He certainly is. That's a hard place to Paul. It's going into turn three. It's wide open going in there. He's trying it. He's trying to fake Roberto out, but it didn't work. Roberto Guerrero, of course, won his first race here, set the track record in doing so, knows this track very, very well. Tracy still on the charge, continuing to challenge Guerrero. One thing Guerrero knows, that Tracy is really young and eager. He really wants to get by. Look at that by the outside. Paul Tracy on turn three and four, dials it to the outside of the course and goes around Roberto. You said, who would replace Rick Mears as the master of the ovals? Here's Paul Tracy, just 24 years old, being taught by Mears and an amazingly aggressive move around Guerrero. Now a fight for second place develops as Emerson Fittipaldi comes up alongside of Scott Goodyear. 
the Canadian that we expect so much out of this year. Won his first IndyCar race at the Michigan 500 last year. Now with the two cars, the 250 cars look the same. There's Tracy behind Emerson Fittipaldi, both of them the same. Now that's not going to make any difference with the teams because Tracy, if he can, is going to go right on by Emerson Fittipaldi. So Fittipaldi comes inside of Scott Goodyear, and he moves past Goodyear. Picks up second place. Now Paul Tracy begins the attack on Goodyear. Paul Tracy, Scott Goodyear had a second at Indianapolis last year and a first in the Michigan 500. You see him being menaced now, but he too is a hot oval driver. Paul Tracy around Scott Goodyear, and he moves into third place. And notice, Paul, that Tracy has been doing outside passes. That means that he's got his car working better, at least right now on the outside. There he goes again on the outside. Then and he does on the inside. Already here on lap number seven, as we watch the two Penske cars, we have begun to overhaul the slower traffic in the field. Phoenix is very short. The pace is incredibly fast here. So it's Mario Andretti that jumps from the outside of the front row and picks up the lead and already begins to pull away. In second place is Fittipaldi and Paul Tracy. After this message and a word from our ABC stations, we'll return. Back at the Valvoline 200 in Phoenix, Arizona, as we're watching a tremendous battle right at the front of the field. And it's a fight between teammates in the Penske cars. Emerson Fittipaldi sits in second right now, but his teammate, the younger Paul Tracy, is That's right behind Tracy him and challenging him here on the bit. straightaway. Now, Paul Tracy comes alongside like of Fittipaldi, and Paul Tracy goes around Fittipaldi just that quick and picks up second place. So two things you got to know about Paul Tracy. He did more testing during the offseason than anyone else and he set the fastest time in warm-up this morning he's really hooked up and now he has mario andretti the leader of the race just in front and they come off the corner three abreast and paul tracy picks up the lead of the race an amazing set of passes first for second and then for the lead and look at paul tracy running through traffic now begins to pull away an incredible run now let's go down to the pitch jack Root has a special alumni of this race well, it's been the first time that I can recall, Paul, that we've ever seen a credential like this. Also, it's the first time we've ever seen Rick Mears at Phoenix not in the cockpit of the car. Rick, a lot of people say you've become the mentor of this team, specifically for Paul Tracy. Some of those moves out there look familiar to me. They look like yours. Uh, it's, uh, the Marlboro car is working very well. He's doing a great job, and uh, we felt like we had a very good race set up, and as it got hotter and the track conditions get worse, we think it's going to be even better. So we're very pleased, but it's going to be a long day. How how tough is it for you to be in this role now? It's really not. I'm very pleased with my decision, and I'm happy here, and uh, I've been enjoying it. So things going well. Paul? Rick Mears won three times here at this track. And there is Emerson Fittipaldi beginning to close up now on the second place car of Mario Andretti. So Fittipaldi now with a challenge, trying to put the Penske team one and two. And you think those Penske's aren't working well as he comes screaming past Mario Andretti. You know, you can just watch those cars. It doesn't make any difference if they're high or low. Anytime at Phoenix and you can have two crews to race on, you can pass a whole lot easier. Passing Mario is normally a big job. So the Penske cars, first and second, Paul Tracy leads it. True, Bobby, but uh, Rick Mears' uh, signature was always the high pass here, wasn't it? And that's what we saw Paul Tracy using. Wow, look at this traffic as they come off the corner. The leaders working their way through the rest of the field now. Four and five abreast. We haven't seen that at Phoenix for a long time. That is the best racing I've seen in a long time. Looks like Scott Brayton was dancing out very high as he came through that corner, but he got it back under control. And there is Robbie Gordon in the 14 car as he begins now to close through this field as well. Good battle for a moment there, and then it broke off between Scott Goodyear and Roberto Guerrero. If you can pick them out of the middle of that, and some incredible racing being done here. Just all the field working together. You now ride on board with little Al. Al qualified in the seventh row, not doing terribly well so far. And you can see he's mired up in traffic that you would not ordinarily expect to be holding him up. Traffic, one of the most difficult problems here at Phoenix. Bobby, you've raced literally thousands of miles here. Trying to get your pace, keep your speed up, and yet run past slower cars is pretty difficult. Oh, it's the worst track that I, that I think they run on, Paul, for traffic. But today, we're seeing passing. Look at that right there. Three abreast running through the corners. Now, you don't normally see that at Phoenix. So it shows that the tires are working better. Goodyear came up with a new tire this year. And that's really helped them. It picked them up about half to a three-quarters of a second per lap. But you 
can tell by the racing that they can run side by side, and the tires are probably the biggest factor. You saw, too, that Scott Goodyear got around Emerson Fittipaldi and is now are around uh, Mario Andretti and is now in pursuit of Emerson Fittipaldi. Paul Tracy still the leader of the race, and he is gobbling up ground at an incredible rate. Paul Tracy, well, that's Cheever, is in the pits. Eddie Cheever, it was uh, 23rd when he came in. He's changed tires and gone back into the action. Bobby, what do you think that might have been? Well, obviously he's got something wrong. Just changing tires means that he thinks something was bad, probably thought he had a flat. So he comes back in, gets it changed, and we'll see what happens to him now. Robbie Gordon, if you're keeping track of the A.J. Foyt car, has moved from 20th up to 7th place. So the car is finally working this weekend. Let's go pit side and Gary Gerald. Quick note on Mario Andretti. Had electronics problems. They had to change the engine after the morning warm-up session. It's working fine, but Mario wants more wing in the car. They'll make that adjustment on his first pit stop. Also, Danny Sullivan, we understand the throttle is sticking. He's having to work it, release it with his toe. So Sullivan has got a handful and a footful, it sounds like. That's very difficult to do here. You know, it's so precision, Paul, and how you back off going into the turn. When you do have to back off for traffic, it really will mess up his speed a bunch. Fortunately, Bobby, the throttle pedal is configured in such a way, unlike a passenger car, that you can do that. Yes, they have a toe strap, a little strap that goes around your foot so you pull your foot back to shut it off. Look at Scott Goodyear as he comes up and finally overhauls Fittipaldi. He used this traffic in front of him to get it done, and his momentum carried him right up to the back of Bobby Ray Hall and Scott Brayton. You know what he did is he caught Emil sleeping. Emil didn't see him coming. Emil got up behind the traffic, and I'll bet he never saw Scott coming by. Now looking back from Ray Hall, as we see Fittipaldi with tail Bobby just behind him begin to close, and Ray Hall goes along lap down to the leaders very early on in this fight. Let it be remembered that Ray Hall, right there in the center of your screen, we're on board with him now, won this race last year, and his success on the one-mile ovals was the centerpiece of his championship effort. He is not doing well here today, and this is going to imperil his chances for defending his championship. You know, Sam, last year they had something. They had a Lola car last year. They had something that nobody else had, because they outshined everybody here by a bunch, very much the same way that Paul Tracy's doing today. Let's go to the pits. Jack Arute has this update. Well, the ball that passed by Emerson Fittipaldi losing that position. Well, listen to this. He's reporting to his team that he is having some problems with the boost on the engine. He is getting slower and slower as the race progresses. They're not quite sure what to do about it. They're just going to hope that he can tough it out. A great shot, too, from Bobby Rahal's onboard camera as you see the rest of the field working past him as we keep an eye here on Emerson Fittipaldi. We can go back and take a look at that pass. Now there is Scott Goodyear working behind Fittipaldi. He moves to the outside. Fittipaldi takes the normal line into the corner. Now you can see Emil didn't expect that to him happen. Emil was watching Fabi, the yellow car right in front of the Benzoil car. He was watching that car so he wouldn't touch him going the turn. Goodyear went right by the outside. That's the easiest way that you can pass people here. You know, it's interesting that Tail Fabi, you see him there. He's running in ninth and now being overtaken by the leader of the race. When uh, Tail Fabi was the first one I ever remember that did that kind of pass here back in 1983 when he won the race, he just hooked up and went around a whole group of cars about two lanes off of the normal groove of this track. Well, you know, Paul, sometimes there's a groove out there that nobody knows, and, and pretty soon somebody will just jump out there and try it. It looks like they're dumb when they do it at times, but when they make it, they look like heroes, and that's the way Tracy is looking when he goes by them. A very busy racetrack here as we keep track of the Penske cars running at the front of the field. Paul Tracy, who's looking so solid here. There's the stats on Paul right now from the EDS scoring system, and we appreciate that information, being able to keep us right up to date. Scott Goodyear runs in second place. Emerson Fittipaldi is still in third. Mario Andretti has dropped to fourth. Roberto Guerrero sits in fifth. In sixth place now is Robbie Gordon, so he continues to come forward. Last year, Paul Tracy finished fourth in this race, and it was by far his most substantial achievement in racing up to that point. I think he has a special feeling for this place, and he's demonstrating it now. Nice thing about being out in front with like Tracy is right now, Paul, is, is he can pick his traffic and his passing what he wants. He doesn't have anybody pushing him really hard. Whereas the guys that are back in the pack, they usually have somebody pushing them, so their passes have to be more conservative. Bobby Rahal now makes it into the pits and is looking for a full tire change. This coming on lap 37, Jackaroot. Well, Paul, the problem is Bobby Rahal says the car is extremely 
Solo, so loose that he felt he had to come in and make an exchange of tires. Going a lap down didn't help either. Of course, this is a new chassis. It only took him 16 and a half seconds to change those tires, but they're still working with the True Sports chassis transition from last year and what they call the Ray Hall Hogan. And they don't expect their new chassis to come out until after the Indianapolis 500. Boy, you could bet if Bobby Ray Hall comes in on lap 37, which is almost 30 laps sooner than he should, it's got to be bad, Paul, and nobody would question that one. Here's we are with Mario Andretti, who has finished second and fourth in his last two Indy starts. And, of course, he was second on the grid here, so he is resurgent. And, of course, with Nigel Mansell out of the race, all the hopes of the Newman Haas team rest with Mario alone, and he really is apt to rise to that kind of occasion. And Sam, I think he probably has more miles than anybody on the track today at this track. Paul Tracy, by the way, took the lead on lap 11. At that time, he took it away from Mario. On lap 34, Tracy lapped Mario. It only took him 24 laps, in other words, to put Mario a lap down, and now he's going for Emerson Fittipaldi. Take a look at that as Emerson sits down inside there. Paul Tracy looks for the position, and Paul Tracy is now looking for his own teammate to lap him. Some of the passes with Tracy have been so outstanding. I really think if I was Roger Penske, I'd try to settle him down just a little bit because he really is outshining everybody today by a bunch. Paul Tracy now tries to work inside Fittipaldi. If he can do this, he has only Scott Goodyear in front of him. He gets the job done, so he has lapped everyone except second place car of Scott Goodyear. The line he's using, though, Bobby, puts me in mind of the line that Nigel Mansell was running in practice and turning in some incredibly quick laps. Yes, and when you're really sticking good, it's obviously the easiest place to pass, but on the outside, when you're passing cars out there, hey, it's dangerous. If the guy slipped just a little bit, they've got you. And as you saw there, he went around Scott Goodyear and has now lapped the entire field in a mere 42 miles. And we haven't seen this happen in years, that somebody is this much faster than the entire field. Scott Goodyear, right there, set on the pole, already been lapped. So Paul Tracy now, keep an eye on this, the 12 car sitting up there high, again looking at slower traffic. He bottles up Scott Goodyear, uses that high line that has been working very well for him, and he has now lapped everyone in the field. Paul Tracy is on an incredible roll here at Phoenix International. You're looking from high above the track in the Goodyear blimp. And there is your field in the top 12. Andretti trying to hold off his fourth place position from a charging Roberto Guerrero. And now Roberto moves out to that high line, working so well for the leader of the race, Paul Tracy. And he picks up fourth place. Let's go to the pits and Gary Gerald. Here's Eddie Cheever out of the car. What was the problem, Eddie? I had a rear vibration right from the beginning. I thought it might have been a set of tires, but it was. I think something is broken in the car. It's very disappointing. We had a good run in Australia. And this is my home track, so we were expecting to do very well here. And it's been a horrible weekend from the word go. But see you at Long Beach. This is tough after a second place here a year ago. That's Eddie. Eddie Cheever, new team this year. They expect much out of that operation. They have been working very hard. Obviously, the Penske organization always works hard. And look at the job that they have done for Paul Tracy and what Paul has managed to do with it. Here's the look back from Ari Leyendijk's car. As we give you the running order after 52 laps. And you saw Robbie Gordon as he came up to overhaul Leyendijk. Robbie Gordon, that's actually a, a pass uh, on lapping position. It wasn't a pass for position. Gordon now runs in fifth place as he just managed to move around and ready. And this is Scott Brayton in the pits. Apparently something serious wrong at the back of his Amway car. Yes, it is. When they pull that hood off, you might as well just know there's something bad wrong. They're Danny looking... Sullivan with a problem as well. Another one. And I don't think it's the heat getting to them, Paul. I think it's early in the year, the type of problems they have. you got to remember, around here, they're turning 13, some of them 13,200 RPM almost all the way around. They don't change much speed. You can tell by how fast my, uh, Mansell went in and crashed by how fast they go all the way around. Apparently, they're working now with that throttle that Danny was complaining about. You can see they have the calling off at the top, and they've been telling him with hand signals. Try it now. Let's see if we can get it to return. These throttles are operated on a real nice steel cable. But sometimes they go all the way through this chassis from way up front where his feet is, clear back to the engine, and they get bound up somewhere. And that's what they're looking for. The battle between 
Robbie Gordon right now and Roberto Guerrero as they fight for position. Robbie Gordon in the black car just exiting the screen there on the right. He had a crash this morning. He's in his backup car at this point, and it's an incredible performance that he's giving because he did not get much practice. He's not familiar with ovals. This is only his second oval race, and yet he has charged up to fifth. He's 24 years old, like Paul Tracy, and I think in many ways he's giving an identical performance, albeit back in the pack. He's in fifth place, but at the moment he is closing on fourth place, Roberto Guerrero. Right now, Paul Tracy is averaging 156 miles an hour. If he can maintain that pace to the finish, he'll be almost 20 miles an hour faster than the lap record. It's an incredible tribute to Foyt's crew that they were able in a very short period of time to get this backup car set up for uh, uh, Robbie Gordon. And it's an incredible tribute to him that he's willing to push an unfamiliar car this hard this soon. The Valvoline 200 now 58 miles into the 200 mile run. You know, Paul, 156 miles an hour. Do you realize it wasn't too many years ago? That would have been pole qualifying speed here. I remember it. You and, and now I, they're averaging it right now. You and I stood down in the first turn, and we were amazed at 150 because that was such a landmark at the Indianapolis 500. Now look at Paul Tracy as he closed up behind Robbie Gordon, and he has traffic ahead of him. This is the key. Does Robbie Gordon know Tracy's behind him? He's been looking ahead of him the whole time. Whoa. And a move on the outside. Way, way very, up. Very dangerous racing here. But when you're driving the kind of race that Bobby, Robbie Gordon is, are you looking in your mirrors? Will he see Tracy there? We'll have to see. Two of these new brash young challengers in IndyCar racing now battle with one another, not for position. It is Paul Tracy trying to lap the fifth place Robbie Gordon, and Robbie doesn't want any part of it. Well, it's it's going to happen, whether he likes it or not, if he stays on the track. Is that Tracy? Mario Andretti in the pits. This is on lap number 60. So this is pretty close to Mario's scheduled window. They make a change in the front wing. Not much of one, though. Looks like a single turn on both sides. The battle continues between Tracy and Gordon. As Tracy looks to the inside and picks him off, just like you suggested, Bobby. You know, to the people that, that want to know, one's a Chevy and one's a Ford. That's a Chevy. The last race we saw it was Ford. That it was running the best. So it's changing. They're continually developing these engines. And Chevy just had a big breakthrough in their fuel mapping. In other words, it's all electronic injection and how they map the fuel through the RPM and power ranges. So they've made a game, Paul. Just passing over now the 62nd lap, 62nd mile. This is when most of the teams indicated they would try and stop, and it will give us our first best indication of how the fuel mileage is going. As you suggested, Bobby, the new Chevy C engines, there seemed to be a question, but they have been working with it, and since he's gone this far, it's logical to assume it's all solved because he is setting a torrid pace. Well, we saw in Australia that the Chevys obviously weren't doing as well on fuel as the Fords did, but... Those guys are all smart. There's a lot of money involved, a lot of engineers, and they're trying to fix it, and they may have her fixed. You know, there was loose talk during the offseason that Ayrton Senna might be driving this car that Paul Tracy is driving. Well, obviously, Senna's still in Formula One, and Paul Tracy is doing this job, I think, as well as anybody in the world could do it. You know what that is, though? That is a dream of Emerson Fittipaldi. He wants to bring Ayrton Senna here. But right now, it is Paul Tracy on the pit road heading for Penske service, and here is Jack. And it'll be a difficult entry because Bobby Rahal's crew continues to work on his car. He hits the marks and overslides them. The crew goes to work. They're very pleased with the handling capacities of the car thus far. They're only going to change tires and add fuel. Tracy waiting patiently. And the longest part of the stop is the fuel. He engages the gears and lights the tires up in 14.4 seconds. He's away, Paul. Oh, what a great stop for the Penske team. And throughout the whole thing, you saw Roger Penske there holding down the transmit button on the radio, talking Paul through every inch of this race. Telling him to use his head. Stay out of trouble. He can win this race. Be careful. Scott Goodyear running in second. Now he heads for the pits as well as the first service stops are underway. Here's Gary Gerald. And we watch and wait with the crew. We see the nose of the car. He glides it in perfectly. Hits that mark. The air guns go to work. We're watching to see if they make any adjustments. Nothing at the rear. Nothing at the front just yet. Goodyear now gets a wing change on the right front side. A half turn it appeared to be. Still holding it. Now a quick turn on the left side. Still holding. Now down to the jack. Now a fast stop, Paul. We've got him in close to 17.5 or 6 seconds. 17 point seconds on our clock. That would be a three second deficit to Paul Tracy on pit stops alone. Nor was he as fast in or out of the pits, which also affects your performance. 
But the uh, Walker Motorsports crew obviously taking it very careful with Scott Goodyear. They want to make sure that he lasts all the way to the end of the well, run. Well, his best finish here so far was 10th. Fittipaldi is in. Now here's Jack. Emerson Fittipaldi, Paul, you'll recall, was complaining of a boost problem in the car, having a little bit of understeer. He just says, I do not want any changes. The boost is okay, and I believe that the racetrack will come to me. So keep the understeer. So they are going to make no changes. He is off and away, and, and he lights up the tires as well, Paul. Well, I'll tell you what, another incredible stop by the Penske team. That was a good sign for the Penske team also, Paul, because they didn't even make any wing adjustments. There were no adjustments made. Now, they might have made some stagger to the tires. In the adjustment, but they would tell that ahead on the radio before they came in. Bobby, there's a lot of stagger run here, isn't there? The outside tires are much bigger than the inside ones. Yeah, it's just about three tenths of an inch. Yeah. yeah. Robbie Gordon runs in third place. He is doing the pits at any time. That Scott Pruitt in his new ride just in front of him. And we'll keep an eye on Gordon as he's due at any moment. That's got to be making Ford and A.J. Foyt really happy to see this boy. No practice in that car. They took it out today, put tires and, and springs on it, the right gears in it, put him out on track and away he went. And he's already going good and he has no experience on the ovals. Robbie Gordon down low and heads on into the pit, so he will get service from A.J. Foyt's organization as he comes in behind Jim Vassar. Gary Gerald? And we're right behind A.J. Foyt as he watches very closely. What a different position for Foyt now, pointing to his head as if to say, think, young man, think. We need to clarify, this is the 92 chassis. It's the one that he crashed this morning. They made the repairs. He's familiar with the setup. He stays in it. We watch the clock tick away the seconds. Now he rolls away. 17.1 seconds for Robbie Gordon. A.J. Foyt, the great champion of IndyCar racing. At Australia, Robbie Gordon told Jack Aruth that uh, his boss was Michael Cranifus, but A.J. Foyt has pointed out to all of us, it is A.J.'s team. We'll be back. Why use Valvoline motor oil? It's the number one choice. Phoenix International and sporting the new colors and a new name, the Airship Eagle, piloted by Captain John Creighton, has been providing some great aerial shots of the track down below. And there you see it, where we are still green. We've been green for the entire 78-lap run. And there's the EDS scoring with Paul Tracy at the front of the field. He has lapped everybody in the field, and that despite his pit stop. Now you take a look, the onboard camera of Ari Leyendijk, who just comes out of the pits. He was running into eighth when he went into the pits. He comes out in tenth. So Ari Leyendijk's time to stay at the bottom of the order at the top ten. But that was Ari Leyendijk's second pit stop. And as he comes out of the pits, he falls further and further behind as Mario Andretti comes past him. Now what's happening, Paul, as we watch the race progress, the real fast cars, like the Penske cars, Michael Andretti, people like that are going for probably a three-stop race. Whereas some of Mario Andretti and some of the other cars, like the like you saw with Lion Dyke, like the Gallus cars, those guys are going for two stops. They're cutting back the boost, turning less RPM, and going trying to beat them in the pits because they can't outrun them on the track today. So we have two different thoughts going so far. Mario Andretti in sixth place continues to try to stay in the fight. He's but, being attacked at the back end of the uh, field as well as the front of the field running very, very tight together. But Mario has not had success passing high. Most of his maneuvers have been down low, and he's gotten trapped quite a few times. And we see a high pass of Scott Pruitt there, but that's been the exception, not the rule for Mario so far. So Fittipaldi right behind Mario Andretti as they both come around Scott Pruitt. Scott Pruitt, that blue and white car, sits just in front of him. He's got a glimpse of it for a second there. As here comes Fittipaldi working inside Mario, and it looks like he may get him in another lap or so. Two former world champions. That car number 90, they just went around as a new team for this year, owned by Tim Duke right here in Phoenix, Paul. Kind of a group of renegades, isn't it, Bobby? Everybody got their, they're all from other teams, and they're so happy just to have put a, a new team together. It reminds you of the old days of racing when you said, hey, let's go racing, and they figured out a way to do it. Tim Duke normally runs a driving performance school. The best indication now is that Paul Tracy and Emerson Fittipaldi are hoping for a two-stop race. That's why they hesitated as long as they did. Now, as we watch Fittipaldi maneuver past Mario Andretti, Fittipaldi continues to run in third. It's not a pass for position there. Fittipaldi's sights are set on Scott Goodyear, who is some distance ahead. 
Paul Tracy still is the class of this field with a tremendous run. And the Penske cars, best indication, are looking for a two-stop run. Can they do it? Well, Paul, I think they're going to be able to do it. And the reason is they're really the class of the field. They're so much faster than the other guys. that I look at the scoreboard and I just see they're going to put laps down or put the other guy's laps down, which means that they can make an extra stop, and especially if they find a yellow flag that will be home free. Well, of course, with Tracy, with a lap on the field, that cushion allows him to conserve fuel and, and keep his cars cool, too. The number nine Duracell car, that's Raul Boisel, driving for Dick Simon's racing team as he comes past his teammate, Hiro Matsushita. Or, excuse me, no longer his teammate. Hero's moved over to the Walker Motorsports team now. And Boisel is carrying to run in seventh place. As you saw Paul Tracy just wind his way in and out of there just as smooth as can be. Yeah, you know, he just sticks his nose under there and says, hey, boys, I'm here. And then he just goes by him so easy, he makes it look like it's first grade against college, you know? It's great when you have a day like that. That's the, that's the day that every race driver dreams for, isn't it, Bobby, when everything just comes right? It is, and, you know, it's really easier for him, and it's harder on the other guy. That's just the opposite of what people might think by watching it. We run the order for you now. Paul Tracy, then Scott Goodyear. Emerson Fittipaldi is third. Roberto Guerrero is fourth. Robbie Gordon, fifth. Mario Andretti runs in sixth place. Raul Boisel is seventh. Jimmy Vassar with a great run is in eighth place. And Al Unser Jr. is ninth. Teo Fabi sits in tenth. And there you see him right there with the leader now beginning to overall him. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, Paul Bobby Unser was speculating as to how and why maybe the Penske team was able to go for two stops. Remember, we alluded to the problems they had in Australia. They changed Bobby Unser, their fuel card for this race. They feel that they have licked the problems they had with fuel consumption. The report thus far for both Fittipaldi and Tracy, excellent fuel consumption from the tele telemetry. Just remember, though, that Paul Tracy has never won an IndyCar race. He's won a lot of other races uh, at the Indy Lights level, but never won at this level. So there's a psychological burden. I'm out front, he's got to be thinking, this could be my race. But there's a lot of pressure. And when you finally break through and you win your first race, chances are you're a lot tougher from there on. But he hasn't won it yet. Just little things like that with Mark Smith in the 25 car there that can just stop the heart of a race driver. Here he is. He's cruising in top spots, a full lap ahead of the rest of the field. But it only takes one little misstep by any other car, and you can be in trouble. That's Jimmy Vassar. He runs in eighth place right now in the Kodalux car. That team looking strong for this year. Remember, Jimmy broke his leg last year. I, I asked him how it's doing now, and he says there's still, a, still some screws and things that they're going to take out eventually, but he's feeling very good. He was a rookie last year, Jimmy Vassar, and he was so popular. Not only uh, did he do well out on the track, but he seemed to earn everyone's respect and affection. A lot of energy behind this man, a lot of people pulling for him, and a lot of them have some money. A quiet, almost shy smile when you see him away from the racetrack. You would perhaps question whether or not someone who is this nice and polite could be a race driver. But boy, when he gets in that car at, at Australia, for example, Stefan Johansson has a problem, rolls to a stop, and this may in fact bring out the yellow. Jimmy Vassar was the fastest Chevrolet engine in the field in the qualifying. He didn't, uh, he wasn't able to carry that to the end of the race, but uh, he did have an excellent qualifying run. Yellow flag comes out for the first time here at Phoenix with 95 miles complete. So the yellow out as we approach the halfway point in the Valvoline 200 at Phoenix. The field will now close up on Paul Tracy. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations is brought to you by Valvoline. People who know, use Valvoline. By Budweiser, the king of beers with that fresh, pure, natural taste, nothing beats a Bud. By Thompson's Water Seal Waterproofing Formula, the brand to trust for all your waterproofing needs. And by AC Delco Automotive Parts. AC Delco, it's like buying time. Still under the yellow at the halfway point here in the Valvoline 200 in just two weeks. The Indy cars will be on the streets of Long Beach in the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Their second run on a road circuit. Nigel Mansell really expecting to be back for that one. But first, we have to complete the run here at Phoenix. The yellow came out for Stefan Johansson. He had a gearbox problem, pulled off the course and out of the car. Danny Sullivan also is out of the race. Apparently, he decided that um, playing with that throttle wasn't a very good idea in the kind of traffic they're running here. 
Allinger Jr. elects under this yellow to make a stop. That certainly gets him to a third stop in this race, and that's part of what they're thinking about in the Penske pits. As the green flag comes out to Paul Tracy, a full lap on the rest of the field. He is still setting a blistering pace well above the record despite the yellow. Which so far, Paul, means that Roger Penske has decided to try for a two-stop race. Otherwise, he would have come in in this yellow. So everybody right now that we can see that's going really fast, leading this race to try and two is going for a two-stop race at the moment. You drove for Penske for a number of years. For him, that's not really a gamble. That's the way it ought to be played. Oh, that's for sure. Penske, what a lot of people call a gamble, is just normal for him, Paul. He just likes hanging out, and he loves watching Paul Tracy. Everyone's been wondering how, uh, how it's going to be with Rick Mears gone. Let's take a look at this, because the indication was that Mario got in trouble here. Keeping an eye, as he came in, boy, he sure did. As he came in and got into the back end, of Ross Bentley's car, the 39 car there. Ross just but both of right them right continued on. It. Yeah, and the, the green flag remains out. You know, Paul, usually that causes a wreck right there. It takes a guy with Mario's experience to be able to touch tires like that. You saw how much smoke came off of it and still keep control. Roberto Guerrero. He continues to run well in fourth place. Let's give you the order again. Paul Tracy, Scott Goodyear, Emerson Fittipaldi, Roberto Guerrero, this 40 car, and Robbie Gordon. Roberto Guerrero needs a solid finish here today. He had a brilliant win, his first win ever in IndyCar racing here back in 1987. But then he was injured at the end of that season. He's never really been the same since. He had that brilliant pole position at Indy last spring. But then, of course, he spun out before the race even began. He needs a solid finish to begin to build a season around. And he might be on route to that right now. You know, everybody will remember him as being the guy that started on the pole in Indianapolis last year. Scott Goodyear into the pits. He's made one stop already, so this is unscheduled. And he's coming in too slow, Paul. There's something wrong with Scott Goodyear's car. He was the pole sitter. He's in the pits now, Gary. Yeah, this caught everybody, I think, by surprise, Paul. He came in with the motor shut off. They're looking back here around the gearbox at the rear of the car. And this does not look good at all. And Scott Goodyear, the man who started from the pole. A terrific young man, former driver school instructor. With a great future expected in this sport, Sam. He was the Ford engine sandwich between two Chevys. Now the top runners are all Chevys as we see Ray Hall make for the pits. Bobby Ray Hall comes in as well. Of course, he's been struggling with his car throughout the day. That's going to make Scott Goodyear dropping out is going to make Jim O'Donnell from Canada really feel sad. And all the Canadian people that are watching this race today. Ray Hall eked out a sixth place in Australia. But here, I think he's in deep trouble. And his chances for uh, defending his championship right at this point do not look really good. But again, Sam, I think that's something that Bobby Rahal has decided he's going to live with until the new car can come in. Listen, Bobby Rahal, is, he has taken the lead in, in getting his own chassis. He has a deal with Honda coming in the pipeline. A new car, as Bobby said, by midseason. He is very much his own man with a great future. This is a temporary setback. And he's turning Columbus, Ohio into a major race car development center. He's using the Ohio State University wind tunnel and everything. We know part of that is, is he's an American and he would really like to see the be an American made car because all of these cars, with the exception of Ray Halls, are made in England. This is a Canadian, English made Penske car, Chevrolet Power. Paul Tracy is running a hell uh, uh, way ahead of the field. You're taking a look here, though, at his teammate, Emerson Fittipaldi, who is in second place and doing everything he can to catch up. Let's go to uh, Gary Gerald. Indication as they work now around the gearbox on Scott Goodyear's car, they believe they have a stripped gear. That's why he's in, and it's going to be a long time. Whether or not he can even hope of getting back out, any chance to win, now long gone, obviously. Stripped gear, believed to be the gremlin for Goodyear. Lynn St. James, the 90 car, runs in 20th place. The rookie of the year at the Indianapolis 500. This year is going to be a full season driving for Dick Simon. Lynn was just recently married to a man who is a real estate developer with big plans for a, a ski resort up near Boise, Idaho. So she's going to have a very, very full life with the full season that you mentioned she has and all the other things going on in her life. Quite a learning experience for any new driver. And there were nine of them that took the green flag here in an IndyCar for the first time. Lynn among them. Look at Tail Fabi as he comes past. I think most of the new drivers, Bobby, come to this track 
just with the idea of trying to keep it as clean as they can the whole way. Well, Paul, I just started to say a little while ago that this is the toughest track, in my opinion, that any rookie driver can come to. And they should all be told, don't try to win the first race because trouble here is brewing all the time. Paul Tracy, the leader of the race, just came around Teo Fabi and Lynn St. James. And Lynn very wisely got it down out of the line of the leader and let him go right on through. Well, you know, we've talked about what a quality field there is. And, uh, to prove in, in the pudding here is a uh, tail Fabi not able to run even in the top three or four, whereas 10 years ago he was a front runner every time out. And I think the reason for this is the series is just so much stronger than it's ever been with good drivers, and that's why we're not seeing a lot of incidents. They're able to run close to each other without causing accidents. It is good to see Tao back and now in the Pennzoil car. He's been away for a couple of years. Scored his second oval win here at Phoenix, 1983. With some spectacular passing. You know, I think obviously that the teams, you look at the yellow car, Tao Fabi, that's Jim Hall's team. Sponsored obviously by Pennzoil, but I think the teams, when they click, the teams shine more now than they ever did in the past because the teamwork between the mechanics, the engineer, the driver, and the owner, and the sponsor all have to work together now more than any time that I can ever remember. Scott Pruitt comes up alongside Hiro Matsushita and just comes right on past him. Now it's Buddy Lazier sitting just in front of him. And Scott Pruitt, new team for him. A fellow that everybody wondered throughout the winter if they were going to come up with anything at all, Sam. Well, and he has something to prove because last year the True Sports car did not do well. Was it a question? Maybe it was Scott Pruitt's fault. Maybe it was the car's fault. So he's like trying to make the point that it was not his fault. And with Ray Hall's problems with that car, relatively, I think he is making that point, and he's having a beautiful drive today, is Scott Pruitt. And certainly by the performance of the car, he is somewhat vindicated. Look at Tao drop to the inside as he continues his battle with Scott Pruitt. And it is a fight for ninth place. Now they split around. They're looking at Ross Bentley's car, trying to find room to come around him. So this battle for ninth between Fabi and Pruitt continues. That really rattles somebody like Bentley when they come around both sides of you. You know, when you're racing side by side and going three and four breaths, that's one thing. But when you don't know if you're going to come by both sides at one time, you know, you can't watch the mirrors on both sides, Paul. So it really surprises you. So the fight for ninth place continues. The leader of the race is still Paul Tracy, followed by Emerson Fittipaldi, a full lap back. Roberto Guerrero is in third. Robbie Gordon is fourth, and Mario Andretti is fifth. So we watch Robbie Gordon now as he begins his attack on third place, Roberto Guerrero. They move around Fittipaldi. And boy, Guerrero, uh, take a look at Gordon as he almost gets into the side of Fittipaldi's car. Boy, that was close. He went in between Boyce Hill and Emerson's car. That really looked like it was a wreck going to happen. I think that was only a, a half a second away from an accident right there. Robbie Gordon in the number 14 A.J. Foyt car. He has an incredible driving style. It seems that he can just place the race car totally sideways, and he's very comfortable when he does that, and then he just dials it back wherever he wants it. Well, you know, right now, I think he's the driver of the day. I know that, that Tracy is absolutely annihilating. He can run away from everybody, but Gordon has no time in the car. They just poked the car together, got it out on the track, and, and he's just going like wildfire, Paul. Robbie Gordon. Looking so solid after having a very bad warm-up practice this morning where he spun in turn three, tapped the wall. Look at him as he comes up to handle up Fittipaldi here. Whoa, now that's the place where any sensible man would back off, but oh. Robbie Gordon just stays right with it and keeps his momentum up and is in a position to pass Fittipaldi. That's really terrific. Jimmy Vassar got an eye full of that one, too, and Robbie just seems, like I said, pitches the car sideways, and off he goes. That was almost a squeeze play right there. You could see it from the other angle. Bobby Rahal out of his car, out of the race. The uh, box-like form there with the sticker on it that you see little Al leaning up against, that's, there's so many G-forces, lateral G-forces as you drive around this oval. You need somewhere to rest your head or you get awful tired by the end of the race. You know, that's new this year for them, Sam. Little Al's been using a strap around his shoulder on the other side. He switched over this year to one for his helmet to lean against. It's not exactly like little Al is weak. He's a top driver, but it, yeah, that's the trouble. Some fairly significant names out of this race. Included on that list is Bobby Rahal. He's with Gary Gerald. Well, the defending champion on the sidelines. Bobby, what was the problem today? Uh, I don't know.
know, Gary. So the car was handling pretty good in the beginning, and all of a sudden the, the handling does, it got really loose, and it just got progressively worse and worse. So I came in and um, we tried some things, but uh, it, there's something wrong somewhere. So we just uh, I think I think I'm a menace to either myself or everybody else out there if we stayed out. Now, Paul Tracy's having the kind of day you had a year ago trying to go wire to wire. Sorry, you're out. We'll see you at Long Beach. Uh, at Long Beach. Yeah, we'll be there. Thank you. All right. Well, Bobby Ray Hall out of the fight. Look at the crowd here today. Beautiful sunny skies overhead. Nice warm temperatures in the 80s. And the battle continues at Phoenix. Here's play. Sorry, Lion Dyke looking for room to race on this track as we keep an eye on Robbie Gordon. There is Robbie Gordon as he comes and look at he and Guerrero as they split Hiromatsu Shida and now come up behind Lazier. And Lazier is getting a mirror full of race cars right now. Paul Tracy in the pits, Jack Aruth. And Paul Tracy comes in for what they hope will be his final stop of the day. If they've worked the calculation properly, he will not be back. They take on fuel, they take on tires. He, Paul, has made no changes whatsoever all day. He wants to win this because it's his father Tony's birthday. A little over 15 seconds, and Paul Tracy back to the fight. Still a lap ahead of the field, though you can lose that lap very quickly here. Here's Ari Lyondike. He runs in 11th place as he comes alongside Matsushita. Dials it down. He wasn't happy with being forced down near the grass on that one. So Paul Tracy has made his stop. Maintains the lead in doing so. 134 laps complete right now. He made the stop on lap 133. Bobby, can he make it to the finish? Well, I, I just figured it out, and he can. I think it's going to make it. If he doesn't have some sort of a problem, he's going to have a lot of lead. He'll be able to turn less RPM, turn down the boost if necessary. Should have no problems. He averages 148.7 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour over Roberto Guerrero's record. And his closest pursuer is his own teammate, Emerson Fittipaldi, who now comes into the pits. So Fittipaldi in for a stop, Jack. Well, Paul Emerson, as you know, is down a lap to his, to his teammate, but he is very pleased with the condition of the car. He complains of the understeer, but the understeer gentleman goes away as the fuel load diminishes. Robbie, Robbie Gordon, Gordon is now on pit road. catches the wall. Robbie Gordon hits the wall. The yellow comes out. Little fire on the turbocharger. That's oil, and it's not a real concern to the driver as Robbie Gordon climbs out. Boy, he had a spectacular day to that point. Robbie Gordon was in third place. In fact, was assuming second as Fittipaldi pulled into the pits. And that's the opposite end of the track that he had the crash at earlier. So he has really tested the walls here at Phoenix today. It's turn one has been the rough place. Boy, he's mad. He really feels bad for what's happened. It probably was his fault. He probably was out there. Foyt talking to somebody down there trying to figure out what happened. I want to be careful. We don't know that what caused this accident. We merely saw the car come off the wall. Yeah. Robbie acting like that. It would seem to be logical that maybe something put him up there that wasn't of his own making. Well, it could have been another car, even. But, you know, a guy's always mad when he wrecks. The kid has been the shining star today. He's really been the class act. He looks like he's driven a lot of oval tracks. I just think he's been the class act today all the, all the way around. Well, as he headed across the start-finish line, he picked up second place going into turn one, and then he got into the wall. Mario Andretti now under this yellow makes a stop. And this yellow certainly going to help any plans that the Penske organization had of going to the finish on just two stops. Well, it's going to help some of the other guys, but unfortunately, I think for them, that the Penske cars are too far ahead of them, Paul. I think they're still going to lose from it. Mario Andretti comes out on the access road, joins on the back stretch as the rest of the field in the Valvoline 200 now circulates behind the PPG pace car. We're under yellow for the second time today. at any one time. So if an IndyCar team can come up with a way that one crew member can do more than one operation, it'll save time. That's the case with the vent man. When he goes down, this is called a vent hose. You can hold it down with one hand. It releases pressure out of the fuel cell to allow the car to be fueled. Now, the other thing is the air jack actuation. This is what's used. There's 350 pounds of pressure that come in this end, and this has to be done with one hand to raise the car. So as he puts this on, there's no pressure, and then raise it, because there's a special bleed valve in this that allows that to take place with one hand. Now, he can take his hand off 
I can actually pull on this hose, and that is locked down. Until the crew chief comes and gives the signal, go ahead and pull this off, drop the car, the car is underway. This is a very small piece, but it makes a big difference during pit stops. 200, I'm Paul Page. It's Robbie Gordon's car that is on the hook now. He brought out this yellow when he caught the wall running by himself between turns one and two. Let's go to the pit side, see what A.J. Foyt thinks about that. A.J., it's really been an up-and-down weekend. The crew worked so hard to get Robbie out there, then he makes this tremendous run, and now the frustration. Well, it's just one of them things we knew would go through some of this this year. You know, we got here, we tested a couple weeks ago, we ran pretty decent, not like we wanted to, and we come here, made some adjustments, and first practice session, we lost a blower with the five laps in the practice, and then we had the other car had a fuel pickup problem. Then we turned around this morning and shook down this car, we changed the motor in, it was running very, very well, and then we uh, had an accident this morning, and then we changed everything and got out here about one minute before they said, gentlemen, start your engines. He did one hell of a job, and I just told him before that happened on the radio, take it easy, baby, we're doing good, take it easy. Well, he's out of the race now. I tell you, this got to be tougher than being a race driver, huh? Well, I would say so. You know, uh, it hurts, but I know it hurts him, too. Uh, but we'll be back in Long Beach. We'll be tough there. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks. Thank you. Paul? So A.J. Foyt concerned about his driver. You know, a number of serious injuries last year led IndyCar officials to implement a set of new safety regulations dealing with the design of the car. Now, Gary Gerald takes a closer look at these modifications. With the start of the new racing season come the implementation of new chassis changes for 1993 to better enhance driver safety. Now, from all outward appearances, this 1993 Lola chassis looks very much like the 1992 edition, but it's now 190 inches from the back of the rear wing to the tip of the nose, or five inches longer than last year. And all of that additional length can be found here at the nose of the car, the idea being to give more protection to the driver's feet and his lower legs. You'll find now five reinforced areas with our bulkheads in the nose. One here behind the dash, a second and a third that handle this part of the suspension, a fourth just beyond the driver's feet in this area, and now a fifth down here where the nose is attached. Last year, if you hit the concrete and knocked the nose off, the driver's feet were about that far from being exposed. This year, he's got all of this additional length to better protect his lower legs. Another subtle little change up here in this part of the cockpit. It's a little wider and a little higher than in the past. The idea being that if the driver makes contact, he now has room where he can actually pull his knees back, not nearly as cramped as it was a year ago. Subtle little changes, but IndyCar officials are confident that these changes will better protect their drivers. And Jimmy Swintel just gives the green flag to the field. We are back to racing with Paul Tracy, a full two laps ahead of the rest of the field. Second place on the EDS scoring monitor is Emerson Fittipaldi. Roberto Guerrero is third. Fourth is Mario Andre. Fifth is Raul Boisel. But Paul Tracy has been incredible. As Bobby Unzer mentioned, Robbie Gordon was spectacular up until he got to the wall. And in fact, you spend more time watching that run of Robbie Gordon up through the field than this wonderfully smooth run of Paul Tracy out in front. Yes, Paul Tracy right now is just cruising. You can watch he's pulling away from Emma, but he's not taking off like he did early in the day. He has no reason to. Penske has told him, hey, you've got to win this race. Take it easy on the car. Shift gears, turn less RPM. Tracy and Gordon are each 24 years old, and make no mistake, they are the young lions of this sport right now. Mark Smith in the black car as he's involved in a little bit of a fight here. Mark Smith, 25. He's a contemporary of them and a guy with a very promising future and another graduate of the Indy Lights racing. There's that car well put together, by the way. The crew chief on this car, Bob Sproul, who took a couple of Penske cars to win. Yeah, he used to be one of my mechanics back a few years ago. He's got a lot of experience. Went away to some off-road and uh, some road racing. Finds his way back to the Indy car now. Has two wins on Bob Sproul's chief mechanic record. Front of the field remains Tracy as we continue to watch this fight. There's Kudrave, you know who has been reason. battling for the last few laps with Mark Smith. Pulls away on this lap, but Mark Smith begins to close back in again. 
You know, Paul, you mentioned some off-road experience, like racing in the Baja. A lot of the off-road specialists are turning out to be very effective at Indianapolis-type uh, racing, largely because of the shock absorber issue. You have to learn to make that car travel smoothly over rough terrain in off-road racing, and the same is true here, even though the track seems smooth. You've got to keep the car level. You know, Sam, the ironically bringing up shock absorbers, that's probably the single most important part of making an IndyCar handle today is the shock absorbers. What's happened is the tub itself, the chassis, has become so rigid that the suspensions really do all the work, so the shock absorbers have really become an important item. Dave Kudre of the 50 car now runs pretty much alone. He was running with Smith for a while there. There's Rick Mears, Roger Penske. I think all of us wondered, with Rick Mears getting out of the sport, whether or not uh, Roger would continue to show the interest that he has, the intensity. But he seems to really like Paul Tracy. We had a dinner with him last year, and he just sat there and raved about Paul the entire time. Take a look at the leaderboard from EDS scoring in the Valvoline 200 at this point with Paul Tracy. Two pit stops, Fittipaldi two, Guerrero two. Can they maintain that? Well, Bobby Unser thinks so. We've just gone past the 153rd mile, as now we ride with Al Unser, who with attrition and staying careful with his driving has moved up into seventh place. Yes, yeah, so a little Al, watch his head. Watch all the vibration that you get. There's over two and a half Gs in the middle of the turns, pushing against his headrest there that Sam was bringing up a little while ago. You know, this is a typical drive for little Al. Bad qualifying and then comes on and on and on in the race. To be sure, he's only up to seventh, but it's been a terrific drive for him. I've never seen this team. The Gallus team have so many problems trying to get race cars working as they have both down at Australia and here at Phoenix today. Well, of course, they were low on the customer list at Lola, and then Al crashed his car just shortly after it arrived, so they haven't tested as much as the others, and maybe that's hurting him. The yep. yellow Kodalux car, that's Jimmy Vassar, who has just managed to get a lap back from Raul Boisel, who is a lap in front of him. Now, Jimmy still has a mile to make up, but Jimmy Vassar in sixth place now running with a good run. And here is Al Unser Jr. as he continues in a battle with uh, Ari Leyendijk, who just came up behind him. And Al Unser Jr. is, of course, chasing Jimmy Vassar, trying to catch him while Vassar is simply trying to get that lap back from Barcel. A nice battle, 6th, 7th, and 8th place. Ari Leyendijk inside of Al Unser Jr. Not a pass for position. But they continue to battle throughout this course. You can watch Leyendijk, who's getting way down close to the white line coming off. Close to the wall, that's a conventional place. Totally opposite of what Paul Tracy has been doing all day. So one, 157 miles complete. Paul Tracy continues his two-mile lead over the rest of the field. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. Suddenly, without warning, Paul Tracy loses it and pops the wall. Dr. Steve Alvey is there with him now. Here's how it happened. Paul Tracy coming off of four, now working the main straightaway. Ducks to the inside, looks for racing room alongside Vassar, and just loses the back end on the pass. Just physically lost it, Paul. I don't see any oil on the track. I don't see it. Boy, look at the cars that almost hit him as they went by. Scott Boy. Pruitt came very close on the apron. Really close, but it looks like there's just no reason except the rear end just got loose and it didn't snap. It just slowly came around. Rick Mears, Roger Penske talking over. They have this race totally covered. Here's another look, same thing. He moves inside the slower car. Back end starts to come around just that quick. He can't catch it and falls into the wall. I believe that the back of his car was sucked into that negative pressure area behind Vassar's car. Sam, there isn't enough slipstream or wind draft really to do it here at Phoenix down the turn. That's the turn that's got the most banking, but it's also the turn where Mansell and Robbie Gordon had problems. Maybe that turn just not working well today. Possible when the car came down that he brushed the brake and that, that kicked it around? Well, you are first partial. of all, you have to be under power, Paul, to have traction in the rear end of these cars, and I think he was off of power, and that's when the rear end starts coming around. Let's go to Jack Arut, who's with Roger. And a disappointment, Roger. What happened? Did he talk to you? Well, I just, uh, I guess he got caught in traffic. That was Jimmy Vassar. You know, that's the same fellow he got in trouble with at Laguna at the end, but you know, basically, it's experience. Uh, had a two-lap lead. Uh, basically, Vassar was five laps down. So uh, 
I just hope he's okay and it's experienced. He sure drove a good race. The cars look good. The Chevy engines are running strong, so uh, let's hope Emerson can bring it home for us. That's why we got two cars. And that's the point. You've got mixed emotions. You're disappointed there, but you've also got Emo still in the hunt now. Well, I guess uh, that's why you have two cars, and I can tell you they're, they're both good, and uh, it was just a tough one for Paul, but he drove a great race. Tough break, but good luck. Thank you. So Emerson Fittipaldi now assumes the lead with Paul Tracy's crash, and under yellow circulates in the Valvoline 200 behind the pace car. He marks the 68th year that a Goodyear blimp has flown over a major sporting event. Today, it's the Valvoline 200 at Phoenix International Raceway, where we are under yellow, 166 miles complete. The yellow for Paul Tracy, who had a spectacular two-lap lead until he slapped into the wall. He limped away from his race car, and uh, this was when Dr. Steve Alvey, a few moments ago, came to his aid. They put him on the uh, back of one of the IndyCar safety vehicles and move Paul then over to the ambulance. We want to check and make sure that Paul's okay because he was uh, favoring one leg there and still limping just a little bit. So we are still under yellow here at Phoenix International and it is one of the toughest ovals that the IndyCars compete on all year. Here's a look at some of the more dangerous events we've seen at PR in the last 30 years. The mile in the desert has always been tough on drivers and devastating on their machines. It tamed Bobby Unzer in 1965. As the technology increased and the speeds grew, so did the incidents. Johnny Rutherford flipped by his own tire. Tom Bagley, Unzer, and Billy Engelhardt. The great mile champion Tom Sneva and Scott Brayton as they got together. In 1986, Jose Garza tried to tame the mile. Ari Leyendyke was leading the race until this pit fire. Even the oval master Rick Mears has had his problems at Phoenix. Bobby Rahal carried you right into the wall in 1989. For Dominic Dobson, the back stretch was very tough. And Scott Goodyear had his problems in much the same place. You rode with Scott Brayton as he avoided Guido Daco. And last year with Scott Pruitt as he avoided Jimmy Vassar with this nifty little piece of driving. And now you add this to that long line of accidents here at the track. Paul Tracy, two laps in the lead, spins out behind Jimmy Vassar and catches the wall. As they are ready to go back to the green, Emerson Fittipaldi has a full lap lead on the field. Jim Swift tall with the green flag, and we are racing once again. Mario Andretti, of course, one lap behind. He still has a chance. Yes, Mario does. He's Mario's been fast all day, not compared maybe to Tracy, but he's been fast all day and consistent. We're on board with Mario right now, going down the back stretch into turn three. And another car loses it up into the wall, and it is Emerson Fittipaldi, the second time a leader has been taken out of this race, both times a Penske car. Emerson barely a full lap under speed, and he's into the wall very quick. Bobby, I have no idea what got in there. Well, Paul, I don't either, but it's obvious that Penske's team has been snake bit today. That's for certain, sure. Whatever happened with Emmo, he has so much experience that I know that something on the car would have failed. He just doesn't do things like that himself. Already the IndyCar safety team there, Roger Penske, gets this wonderful piece of news. Nigel Bennett was right there with him, the designer of these two cars. You got a glimpse of him for a moment there. Let's see if we can tell what happened here, Bobby. Roll in the third, it just snapped. Now, you see, that was a snap spin. Obviously, opposite of what we saw with Tracy. It looks to me like he broke a U-joint, something like that in the drivetrain, because it just snapped around quickly. And what that will do is give the lead of the race to Mario Andretti. You saw him there. Here is Emmo up into the wall. 
It appears that Fittipaldi is all right, but Jack Arut may be able to update us on what happened. Well, Bobby Unser, once again, you were absolutely right. It snapped because Emerson Fittipaldi radioed in and said something broke on the right front of the car. Right front of the car, Bobby. Well, Emil might not, might not know. Remember when the driver's going into the turns, he's going in there 180, 185 miles an hour. He doesn't really know what happened. He just knows that something broke or something gave way. Often, sometimes you run over something, a tire explodes because you puncture it real fast. It's like a blown out deal. But I think in this case, it looks to me like there's something probably in the rear end that gave away. Let's watch it again right here. Second time today, by the way, Scott Pruitt has come very close to getting involved in something. He was the next car down ahead of Al Unser Jr. And the whole rest of the field was still pretty well closed up. There's Emerson Fittipaldi. Thank goodness he appears to be okay, but not happy. He's had victory in his hands and thought that he had this race won after watching his teammate lead by full two laps most of the way. Yeah, totally unavoidable on Emerson's part. He just, he just rolled it out when it happened. So 173 miles are complete in this race that went so smooth for so long and just in a very short span of time has taken away two leaders. We'll be back. 73 races since his last win. He circles now behind the PPG pace car with 24 miles to go to the finish of this race. As soon as they come back green, he will have a full lap on the field. One of his owners, Paul Newman. What a weekend they have had, both Newman and Carl Haas. The problems yesterday with Nigel Mansell. Then watching the Penske cars dominate and both Penske cars crash. And Mario, after a spectacular qualification run that put him on the outside of the front row, in trouble. Mario now out in front. Saturday on ABC Sports, the Professional Bowlers Tour rolls in with the BPAA U.S. Open. Then on ABC's Wide World of Sports, world-class athletes meet in Cancun for the second challenge of the Jeep Superstars. And from Austria, celebrate the International Special Olympics presented by Dollar Rent-A-Car all Saturday on ABC Sports. Bobby, at the outset, you mentioned the new order of things in IndyCar racing and, and mentioned Gordon and a couple of the other young guys. There's Carl Haas, the owner of Mario's car. Who would have thought that at this point in the race that the oldest driver in the race would be leading it, Mario at 53? Well, you know, Sam, also I think we've seen one of the most exciting races here at Phoenix. Totally unpredictable than we've ever seen before. Allinger Jr. in, tops up for fuel. You know, one guy who was really solid here, Allinger Jr., by the way, was running in fourth, was really solid here in, in his heyday, lives here now out in Paradise Valley. It's Tom Sneva. He has a, a golf course that he's part of. He calls it the, uh, the Tom Sneva 500 Club. And on that course, he's got this. You talk about a golf cart. We're talking, look at that 500 winter ring there on Sneva's hand. You're talking major, major golf cart here about what 120 miles an hour look at this from tom a real hot rod well it's too bad he didn't enter it in the race he might be doing pretty well he by could, now he could be running about fifth place right now <laughs> looks like he's having a great time in the desert just outside of phoenix arizona we'll be back for the conclusion of the valvoline 200 and let me tell you it is not over yet and 80 miles the uh, distance traveled 20 to go we're still under yellow mario andretti the leader of the race not at a record pace any longer the yellows of the last few laps taking out both leaders paul tracy and emerson fittipaldi have had a dire effect upon the average speed of the race the record will still belong to roberto guerrero but will mario andretti finally break that streak it's been a long time since he has won an Indy indycar you can trace it all the way back to July 3rd of 1988 at Cleveland. Mario said that he's been missing the presence of his son, Michael, terribly on the team, but I think this will breathe all sorts of new life into him. Jimmy Vassar, he runs in third place. His best career effort thus far was seventh last year at Long Beach. Here's how he ran throughout the day. Nice, steady run for Jimmy Vassar. So it's Mario Andretti, a lap ahead of Raul Boisel, who is two laps ahead of Jimmy Vassar. Just think of how often in the years at Indianapolis and other races, Mario Andretti has been what you call snake bit. Only 20 laps to go, a lap cushion here right now. It would seem to be wrapped up for Mario Andretti, but because of his particular string of bad luck, you really wonder if it is. 
I'll tell you what, if he doesn't win this race, he's going to remember what you just said, Sam. There's no question <laughs> in my mind about it. Well, and he's very superstitious, too. Exactly. Uh, That's why he's going to remember. <laughs> he probably has more experience than all the guys behind him totaled up. Just think about well, that. Well, Bobby, it's his 40th run here at Phoenix, and the guy with the next most experience, now that you mentioned that, was Ray Hall with just 14 starts. So the green flag now flies again in the Valvoline 200. Mario Andretti, a full lap on the field. But we have seen that top slot change twice in the recent laps. Small little mistakes, but we're talking one of the great veterans here. As he carefully moves down the back stretch, picking up the pace, no hesitation whatsoever. Raul Boisel is in second. In third place is Vassar. Allinger Jr. is fourth, followed by Teo Fabi, Ari Leyendijk, Scott Pruitt. Kudrave and then Mark Smith. Fittipaldi was the contact with the wall. He was in the lead, and he's falling down through the order now as the rest of the leaders continue to pass him. It's pretty good when you're in Mario's position and you look in your mirrors and you see two men who have not won an IndyCar race. Fittipaldi out of the race. As we mentioned, here's Jack Root. Emil, first of all, you've been released. You're okay, but what happened out there? Well, when Paul Tracy crashed, I got a uh, debris from his car and they heated the rear wishbone on my rear suspension and uh, I asked Roger to have a look on the pace laps and he had a look it looks I lost a board cylinder but something went under the rear suspension and damaged and going to I was very easy going to turn three just snapped the rear wheel and I lost control unfortunately it was a great race so we were doing a great race well it's a tough break for for Emerson Fittipaldi but also coming out after a problem is Paul Tracy Paul, first of all, your condition, you had a little bit of a problem with a knee. Yeah, I uh, banged up my knee. Uh, you know, everything's all right. You know, we're having a good race, and, and you know, we're running really good in traffic. And then... Uh, and what happened there? It uh, just seemed like some of the guys didn't want to, you know, need to the, up the blue flag. And, you know, it's disappointing to be up a couple laps, being in the lead. And, you know, we'll, we'll come back at Long Beach. Just want to say hi to uh, my wife, Tara, and I'm all right. Amazing. In less than five minutes, both one and two out of the race, Paul. Yeah, but a newlywed, he's figured out exactly how to handle it as he said, he says hi to his new bride. Now we keep an eye on the field with Ross Bentley and Marco Greco as they battle for position. You know, I think a lot of fans across the country have been excited by a lot of the new drivers coming into this. But this moment right here with Mario out front is going to bring a resurgence of feeling for some of the older drivers. And I think a lot of people probably pulling for him right now. You see him pulling up behind two much younger drivers, looking for a spot as he goes into turn one. And they're involved in a battle right there as Mario has to be very careful coming up behind Matsushita, who runs in 10th place right now. And he was careful very careful he knows that victory is within his reach just 10 miles away if he can only hold on that's a neat thing about mario at this particular time he laps his slower cars but he's got so much experience he's won so many races he knows the easiest way to lose a race is right at the last by doing something stupid so if something happens with him i'll bet you it's going to be the car not mario he won here in 1966 again in 67 and then in 1988 20 years after that. Now he's poised to win five years later than that. Incredible Alan, record. Allinger Jr. in fourth place, closing in now on third place, Jimmy Vassar. We've been watching little Al, Paul, as he comes in the pits lots of times, about three times in a row. They've been working on the rear wing of the car. Now this Lola's new to them. Some of the other Lola's in the race have got some new under trays, some new under panels to the car, the downforce equipment. They don't have it on the Rick Gallus car. So they've been working on the rear wing, trying to get his hand in. And Bobby, in, in two weeks, of course, we'll see little Al in action at Long Beach where he has been so dominant in the last few years. So coming off of this race strong is going to be a huge uh, bit of confidence building for him. Well, their car testing that they're doing right now, Sam, has a lot to do with what they're going to be able to do at Long Beach. Allinger Jr. very carefully moves through path traffic. He is in fourth place. Teo Fabi is behind him in fifth. Ari Leyendijk is sixth. Scott Pruitt, seventh. Kudre runs in eighth. Mark Smith is ninth. Matsushita, tenth. Ross Bentley, eleventh. Marco Greco, 12th, and Lynn St. James runs in 13th. There are 13 cars running at the moment. Ari Leyendijk, you now ride on board with Ari in sixth place. A frustrating day, I think, for Ari so far, don't you, Paul? Because here he is with a new team, the Chip Ganassi team. Very promising. A lot of people thought this would be a front-running combination. It hasn't been on a track that he has won on before. I think they were expecting great things. And speaking of expecting, 
his wife Mika is expecting a uh, two kids, twins. Ari Leyendijk, I think within his team, Chip Ganassi's organization, they are still getting accustomed to one another a little bit more, and he's definitely a, a factor to watch in the upcoming season. For Mario Andretti, five miles to victory. It has been such a long time. In his pits, <laughs> you can imagine what they're thinking. What a weekend they've had. And you think of the way this weekend began with all the focus of attention on Nigel Mansell. Nigel this, Nigel that. He well deserved it. He was the fastest man. Mario was in his shadow. And Mario might have been frustrated earlier in this race when he dropped from the front uh, row position, second fastest qualifying, back to sixth, even seventh briefly. But he kept his patience. He's come up. The race came to him. McGee, the team manager that we were looking at there, living another long day trying to win a race. I'll tell you what, he was instrumental in managing Nigel Mansell's victory at Australia. And consider what Carl Haas is thinking about here. The possibility of wins in the first two races of the season. One with each of his two drivers. Carl Haas came down in my motorhome this morning, and the poor guy sat there playing with my Siamese cat, just shaking his head, thinking what a terrible weekend he was having so far. Now look. Mario Andretti, his car leading the race, very good chance of winning it. You wonder if Carl can hold his breath along with Paul Newman for the remaining distance, because as Mario comes around this time, Jim Swintel will have the white flag indicating one more lap to go, and Mario Andretti will be on his way to victory number 52, second on the all-time list to A.J. Foyt. 31 of his wins have come on ovals, and Mario Andretti has taken that white flag. Paul Newman watches. They hope for Mario Andretti that dry spell may finally be over. Traffic just ahead of him. Ever so careful now as Mario Andretti can see the checkered flag just ahead. Twin checkered flags come out, and Mario Andretti in the Kmart Texaco Avalon Lola has taken the victory. What a weekend for Newman Haas Racing. An incredible time, and Paul Newman couldn't be happier. It just shows you never quit. You never can tell what's going to happen. There's a very special bond between Paul Newman and Mario Andretti of mutual respect. Neither of them uh, likes to be predictable. Mario's used the phrase so often, you wear the armor. He drives as a gladiator. Today, he fought his way through the traffic, the tensest and most difficult race in Phoenix in many, many years, and came out front. And now, all he has ahead of him is an empty track as he comes up to the checkered flag area here. So what that will do is put Newman Haas's team with their drivers 1-2 in the points fight. Mansell is second in the points despite missing this race, and Mario is in the lead by 11 points. Mario Andretti rolls to a stop and begins to unbuckle. He is the winner here at Phoenix. We're running out of time, but we're going to do our best to talk with Mario Andretti. Let's go to Jack. Well, Mario Andretti getting out of the car, running out of time, but not for you. Congratulations, Mario. Uh, thank you. It's just so wonderful. I'm so happy. I'll tell you, Fred, it goes to my cruise day. You have to change an engine today. And we just hung in there. You know, it just... Uh, it was not the perfect setup, but we got it better and better, and uh, the guy just did a marvelous job getting in and out of the pit. And the emotion, the emotion of the weekend, what with Nigel Mansell's problems and with you. Describe it for a minute. Well, you know, uh, it's so wonderful to be able to bring it home for the team because, uh, you know, that was uh, a natural setback, but, uh, you know, the man upstairs was looking after us, and... Uh, God, I'm so happy. <laughs> Paul, it's Andretti again, but this time Mario, and it's been a while. Mario Andretti takes the win, followed by Raul Boisel, Jimmy Vassar, and Al Unser Jr. Here at ABC, we'll see you in two weeks on the streets of Long Beach, California.